Hello, everyone, and welcome, welcome to Onward Productions uh, Virtual Fireside tonight. Uh, we have with us today Brother Anthony Sweat, as well as Brother Chad Hymas. Anthony, how are you doing? This is the first week we've had you on. Hey, I'm so happy to be here. This is making my day. I look forward to sharing a message and being with this group. <laughs> yeah, we're excited for you to be with us, too. And Chad, how are things in Rush Valley going? Things are good? Yeah, they're doing good. I hope people aren't sick of us. We got our sound fixed, so we should be a, a little bit better than Mother's Day last week. <laughs> hey, it was just, uh, you know, they, they were they 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 were probably feeling through the spirit, whatever it was. It was good. So, but no. I would I would I would hope for that forgiveness and hope that that is true. I'm just going to live off of that. So, uh, but I I do I do want to apologize to everybody for the sound last week. This week will be much better. We got uh, we got better sound. We got Anthony, so we're good. Yeah, yeah, no, it sounds great, and we do. I'm, I honestly am super excited, guys, for today. I mean, I, I, uh, I cannot say how much I love, love the speakers and presenters that we have today. I mean, honestly, as incredible as they come. And uh, I mean, I'll introduce them here in, in just a minute. Uh, just as we begin, though, what we're going to do is we're going to just say a quick prayer, uh, just that way we can start the, uh, the fireside off right and make sure that we have the spirit with us. Uh, just as we have the fireside today, I just want to encourage you guys. Honestly, as you have questions or uh, anything in that regard, I mean, whether they're personal or whether you want to ask them, write them down. Write down your feelings and write down as far as what you feel or the impressions that you need to act upon. And I can just promise you from my own experience, especially having listened to these messages here every week, I always have a prayer answered. And, you know, if I can have prayers answered, I feel like I'm, I'm doing something right, or at least trying and making that effort, because I believe that God is just giddy to answer our prayers. So I just want to encourage everyone to do that. Uh, let's start off with a prayer. The prayer will be given by my brother, uh, Thomas White. Thomas, do you mind giving us the prayer? Yeah, I'd love to. <clears throat> our dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful that we can come together this evening for this virtual fireside to be able to hear from Brother Sweat and Brother Hymas. We thank thee that for the, for the preparation that they've put into being able to teach us more about our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray that, that thou wilt help us to come away from this with a better understanding of thy son and his atoning sacrifice and, and, and how we may draw near unto thee and unto him. And we pray for Brother Sweat and Brother Hymas at this time that that the Holy Ghost will inspire them and, and, and instruct them on, on how our, our needs can best be met through the promptings of the Spirit. And, and these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Tom. He is, uh, he is the, my older brother, the one who's a little less good looking, not as good looking as me, but much more humble too. So <laughs> thanks, Tom. Um, well, guys, thank you once again. I'm really excited as far as for our fireside tonight. Uh, what I'm going to do, so once again, my name is Michael White. I uh, am from the uh, Facebook page, High Five Live, if you're familiar with that. Uh, it's honestly an awesome page. If you want daily messages, seriously, go like it. It's, it's a great page. We've had Brother Hymas on there many times before, as well as Brother Sweat. Uh, literally just messages from, from members of the church, as well as even other other denominations uh, daily, literally daily. And so it's, it's honestly a great page. Uh, our first speaker who I'm going to, to introduce is going to be uh, Brother Hymas. And just before I do so, as he speaks, I sincerely mean this, guys, ask questions. Just in the comments page there on Facebook or wherever you're watching, please ask questions. And at the end of the fireside, after we say the prayer, Brother Sweat as well as Brother Hymas will be sure to reply to those questions. We'll ask a few of them. Uh, and yeah, please, please engage. I mean, that's that's one of the things that presenters love. And so please ask questions. Uh, so our first speaker will be Brother Chad Hymas. And Brother Hymas, I now know, lives and resides in Rush Valley. Uh, honestly, an incredible human being. He's part of the National Speakers Hall of Fame. And uh, it's spoken all over the world. One of the greatest things about Brother Hymas, though, is he always always puts God first. I mean, I can't tell you how often I've worked with him and he will always, not in just his demeanor, but he'll always say something like, well, if this is for furthering the kingdom, then, you know, let's do this. Or he'll, I know when he travels, you know, I, I've seen him traveling for work and he'll go and do firesides for missions or for wards and stakes. I mean, he loves 
loves being able to, to just bring his message uh, to really just, just further the spirit. And so I, I honestly, I, I absolutely love that about him. Uh, Brother Hymas, I'm going to turn the time over to you so that way we can hear your message and we're, we're super excited. Sounds great. Thanks a lot, Mike. Thank you for the prayer. Uh, a huge shout out to Shane and to Maddie Johnson for putting us on Onward Productions. Um, like them, follow them. Uh, the daily messages that they put out are inspiring. They keep us on the straight and narrow. Uh, their inspiration themselves that they uh, that they then transform onto the network and and via technology for us to read and to look at every day truly do help and inspire us. And I am honored to be able to share the share a few messages today with Brother Anthony Sweat. It's going to be a, a great privilege. So tonight I'm going to share something a little bit uh, well different for sure. I try and bring something different every time. I have the opportunity to to be on this platform. Uh, I don't. It's not really about me. Um, and I would challenge you tonight that tonight's not about you. The theme that we have chosen tonight as a group, as we've prayed about it this week, and as Shane and Mandy have have thought about it, um, is, is steadfast in Christ. And so I, I have thought about that, and it's very very. Well, it goes both ways. I mean, the righteous could get more righteous, and the wicked get more wicked. And and through tough times it's easier for the righteous to let go of the iron rod. We, you know, Lehi had a vision about that as people are approaching the tree of life, even, even his own children who uh, were brought up in righteousness. And as we have children in our own day and age that are brought up in righteousness, when things don't go the way that we plan, when graduation is canceled, when, when we live in a very, very uncertain world and we're going through an, an era of time that we've never experienced before in our life. I am talking about the pandemic, which in some form or another surely has affected everybody that's watching tonight. Um, I, I'm not an expert on pandemics, but I know what it's like to lose some things. And I would challenge you, principle number one that I'm going to ask you to write down is that it's very easy to get caught up in yourself and how you're feeling and, and what your losses are. And that's okay. But there's nothing wrong with that as long as you don't stay there. That's my problem. Let me see if I can give you a good example of that. So I want you all to know that right now I'm in my studio and and I I, I made this as the pandemic was occurring and I was unable to fly because the planes were being parked on, on jetways and, and I, I unable to travel and do what I love to do. Unable to stay in Marriott's and, and Hilton's and, and do something that I'm passionate about. And so made this, but right outside of this, just, just maybe a hundred feet is my passion and my dream. And I want you all to see what that is. This is phenomenal. So this is right outside. So check that out. So that's, that's out in our fields. In fact, they, they look that way right now. They're green. There's a water line behind. Um, uh, I love water. Uh, you know, those of you that live in Utah, you know that water is not easy to come by. It's very, very difficult. You have to pray for it. We have to work for it. And then we have to live worthy to have it. Let me say that again. And I'm gonna have you write that down. During times of challenge and even times of posterity, we have to pray for it. We have to ask. We've got to work hard. And then we've got to live worthy to sustain it. These are things that help us during times of pandemics. Work for it. Excuse me, pray for it, work for it, and then live worthy to have it. Look, look, look at the grass. I love green fields. Something that's also different to have, but, but, but fun to have in Utah. And then look at that elk. He's got eight points on the left side and eight points on the right. I've always wanted to raise elk. It's a passion for me, and it's something that I absolutely love. Now, when I broke my neck in that field, my dad came to me in the hospital, and he told me in his blessing that he gave me as I woke up from a coma, that I could still be a guide, still do my dream, still be a farmer. I, uh, I don't want to tell you what my response was to him, but it wasn't very positive. And that was probably one of the first pandemics I've ever experienced. I mean, it was a huge loss, loss of legs, loss of hands, loss of midsection, stomach muscles, two out of my three chest muscles. I lost the complete use of my fingers and my hands on both sides and most of the strength the use of my arms and, and and my triceps. Uh, yeah. they're, they're, there's as high as I can raise my hand right there. When I when I go to sustain somebody at church, I mean that that's as good as it gets right there. I mean, I I mean, it's not that little gravity can't help. I can get my hand about about like that, and then it it'll hit gravity here soon, and then it just and it just kind of hits me. I mean, that, that's that's how it works. And so I lost 95%. And in my dad's blessing, he told me that I could still be a farmer and a guide. I uh I didn't believe him, and I asked him to leave it alone for 63 days. Now, I didn't give him the number 63, but 63 is significant because that's how long he's in the hospital. So for 63 days, 
my dad did not bring up again the optimistic vision of me being a farmer and a guide. He didn't talk about it anymore. He just let me sink it in. The day after I got home, day number 64, at 5 o'clock in the morning, 5 a.m., somebody came into my room unannounced and uninvited. It was my father. I mean, he doesn't live with me and my wife. He, he came into my room. Oh, my wife, she was already up, which means she's in on this. There's something going on, and it's a conspiracy. Something is happening, and my wife and my dad are in on it together, and they wake me up. My dad and my wife then proceed to dress my body in my camouflage clothing, which I love so much. I do love camouflage clothing. My dad picks me up like a baby. As an adult, he, he picks me up just like this, gets me out of, my, out of the bed, and he carries me to the rig, his truck. We call it a rig. Sets me in the passenger seat, puts my then electric wheelchair. So it wasn't a chair like this. This, this is a manual wheelchair, one that I've learned to push with numb hands and, and knobby tires. Back then, electric wheelchair. I didn't say electric chair. That's different. Electric wheelchair, four-wheel drive, two motors, a little bit more power than some of those Chevys I've seen drive out on the highway. I mean, this thing's got some juice to it. And my dad put my seatbelt on. He put the trach or the plug back in my neck, good thing so I could still breathe, put the battery pack on the console so the battery could run to feed air to my neck. And my dad drove me to that piece of ground that I... several thousand acres it's in the rocky mountains elevation 82 to 10 4. and if you got elevation to 10 4 green grass isn't so hard i mean it's i guess it's like mount sinai for moses it's 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 not quite that deserty but but it's it's definitely god's country i believe he resides there that's my personal opinion aspens and pines everywhere i mean Water. We got water because there's mountain on the peaks. And if you got water and streams every year, that means you got trout. This is God's country for sure, in my mind. My dad got me out of the truck, set me in my wheelchair, and both my brothers, who are younger than I, they pulled up right behind in their trucks. One brother put a bandana on my head, camouflage in color. The other brother, he poured elk urine on the top. I hope you're not laughing. And it's probably a good thing that I can't see any of you, because if I saw you laugh, I would be offended and probably just shut myself off right now. My brother poured elk urine on my head. So now you all have a better reason of why I was invited in the first place. What's the reason? I'm just going to ask. Type in your answer. Type it in. The answer is not bait. That's the wrong answer. You bait fish, you bait bear. You don't bait elk. Elk come in for one reason and one reason alone. It's... Uh, I don't know. Let's just call it what would be appropriate. Let's call it um, loving season. Let's call it loving season. They have a season for that. You can ask your parents about that if you're youth. Elk come in for loving season. My dad and my brothers put me behind a pine tree, and then they climbed up into a 14-foot tree stand. Do you see anything wrong with that right there? Um, there's something wrong with that. But just right there in that picture in your mind. My brother recorded what happened that day. And I want to share it with you because it has everything to do with our message. Watch close. This is absolutely unreal. Listen, too, because I want you to hear what an elk sounds like. Listen close. Listen. There it is. That's the Rocky Mountains. Indian Canyon. Got aspens and pines right in front of us. You're going to hear a bull elk. Listen, listen. They screech. My dad waits for a little bit, and he makes a cow call back. They're trying to get him closer. Watch this. Watch. As soon as I see horns, as soon as I see horns break the timber line. Look, look, look. I realized something. That's a six by seven bull. I count up the number of the horns. You'll see it right here. The breakthrough. The cow calling. He makes more noise. I see the horn movement. I count up the points. He's a six by seven, weighs over 1,400 pounds, easy. Very nice bull. That's a, that's a mature bull. And he's coming right for the scent. Watch how close he gets. Watch, watch, watch. That's me. 
You'll see right here. That's me in the wheels. Look at him. He's, he's talking. He's coming right, right, right for the bait or the mate. And watch how close he gets to my wheelchair. He's calling off other bulls. He's marking his territory off. And watch how close he gets. Less than a foot away from my face. Right there. Notice how quick my family is to help me out. Nobody got out of the trees. Nobody helped me out. And I went home that day. And because I was focused, this is principle number four. So remember, number one is to pray. Number two is to work hard. Number three, live worthy. Number four is to maintain some sort of hope or faith. That's where I lost it. I lost hope because life wasn't going the way that I had planned, like it is for many of you right now. I'd lost my legs. I realized that day that I couldn't do it the way that I wanted to do it. I couldn't do it the way that I, I couldn't stand up. I couldn't get up in the tree stand. I couldn't call the elk in. I couldn't take the pictures on the camera. Only they could do it. And because I got so focused on myself for the next five years, I'm not, I'm not misspeaking here. I, I want you to count, count, the, count that number, five years. For the next five years, I refuse to go look for elk. Five years. Don't get me wrong. I got invited to go all the time. But for five years, I refused to go and look for those animals. Not because I couldn't, but because, number four, I lost faith and I had lost hope. Like the people that let go of the iron rod that got off track. And during pandemics and during epidemics, that's when God sees who his army really is built of, sees what his people are really built of. I don't have it mastered, trust me. I still have shaky days, but I know what the right answer is. And it gives me a much firmer justification to, to try and be on his side. For five years, I refused to go look for elk. Something changed my behavior. And this is how this is the capstone of the story. On year number five, my dad called me up my, on my phone and he said, son, Will you go look for elk with us? And we want you to join us. We want you to come and be a part of the fold. We want you to come into our to our to our flock. What do y'all think my response was? I said the same thing I've been saying. Why, why change? Nothing's changed with me. God hasn't fixed my neck, hasn't fixed my legs. So I said the same thing. I said, I'm not going. And then he said something that pierced me before he hung up on me. He said this. Son, I just want you to know that it's been five years. I said, Yes, sir, I know. He said, how long has it been since your boys have been out there to what you call heaven? When was the last time you showed your boys what heaven looked like? He asked me that. You all know the answer. I've never taken them because I've been focused on what I lost, not what they could gain. I've been focused on my losses, my loss of a job, my loss of an income, my loss of a courtship with my spouse. She wasn't doing anything wrong. I just was focused on what I could no longer do. I, I can't even hold her hand. And because of that, I robbed other people of heaven. My dad said, I'm not going to let that happen. I'm taking your two boys tomorrow. And then he hung up the phone. Let's stop right there. My dad meant business. How do you know when God means business? When you and I desert him and stop serving and giving to other people. When he uses words like, through his prophets, Sorry, I must speak with plainness and such boldness to you people. He has said that many times in the scriptures. Must speak with boldness and plainness. That's when God means business. And I have felt that many times in my life where he has needed to straighten me out a little bit. My dad brought up my kids. And would you agree with me on uh, as you watch this that you would do things for others that you won't do for yourself? Maybe you'd give up some coins in your pocket to help somebody have some food. Or maybe you would do something for somebody else that, you just, you just won't do for yourself. Here's the catch. This is the last principle I'll share with you. You can't help others with credibility unless you take care of yourself first. Otherwise, it's called hypocrisy. And we all know how God feels about hypocrites, people that say one thing but live a different life. That, that's me. That, that's where I was at. When my dad said he was taking my boys, I quickly came back to the flock. And uh, the most amazing thing happened, and I want you all to see it. My brother took a picture that day. It's rather incredible. It's my most favorite picture of all time. Look at that. The first thing that I want you to notice in that picture is the boots. Now, I can't wear those anymore, not because I won't put them on, but because they're hard for me to get on, and they're also dangerous for me. 
Uh, narrow boots are very, very bad for, a, for paralyzed feet. They cause pressure sores, and pressure sores are the number one cause of death for people like me. So, so it's not falling down on the ground and cracking my head open. It's not, uh, you know, loss of breath per se, or it's not even the COVID-19 virus. The number one cause of death for people like me is having a pressure sore, a red mark that goes septic, goes deep, because you don't feel it. Uh, a lot of times they happen on your feet or your backside or your bottom. And so those boots are very sacred to me because it remembers, it reminds me of what, what I used to be able to, to wear. I want you to look at these jeans. Those are called Wranglers. Just an FYI to those of you that are watching, and I'd like some of you to make comments on this. Wranglers are what Christ's disciples wear. Those are real men pants. That's all I have to say about that. Look at his jacket. Look, wait, 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 look, look closer. Look closer at the jacket. It's not his. It's mine. It's too big. Look how big that jacket is. My wife took it out of my gun cabinet, put it in his duffel bag, asked him to wear it, hoping that it would change my behavior. When I saw him with my jacket on that day, I realized that I had never bought him his own. So we went to Bass Pro Shop, Cabela's. Did you guys all know that you cannot go to Bass Pro Shop or Cabela's without spending a couple thousand dollars? Did you know that? I, uh, I, I spent money I didn't have. I'm, that's not the principle tonight. Don't, don't, don't repeat that to anybody. I'm just saying I maxed out credit cards. I guess I was making up for lost time. And what's the best part about that picture? Just type it in. Yeah, I can see. Look, look. Type in what the best part of the photograph is right there. What, what is it? Here it comes. Family. Family's, family's right. Look, look, look at his face. There we go. His smile. When I, has, when I saw his smile, I thought of a couple things. And what I thought of was what I had robbed for five years because I chose not to stay steadfast in, in my Savior. Uh -huh. Are you willing to risk the opportunity that you can do for other people, the, the windows of opportunity? because we're so focused on what we lost or ourselves or the pandemic that we're going through and how it's affecting us. We get so caught up in us, us, we, we, how much I earn, how much I made, how much I used to make. Uh -huh. The fact that I can't graduate, I deserve a graduation. We get so caught up on those things that we, we forget that perhaps our attitude, our countenance, our light affects everybody else around us. I want you all to know that I haven't missed a hunting season since then. Not to go kill an animal, just to take pictures. I'm sick and tired of robbing other people. And I think it says somewhere in the commandments, you're not, you're not supposed to take from other people. It says something like that. I, I don't know. It's just good practice to not, to not rob. Huh? Let's end tonight with, as I wrap up my session with a couple of, a couple of quotes, a couple of memes that you can take a, Take a screenshot of that will help us understand tonight a little bit better. Check this. Here we go. Take a picture of that with your cameras. Screenshot it and put it in your home. It's 2 Nephi. You must press forward with the steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope. The one thing that I was giving up on, you can't do the other four without. you got to have the hope. And that's the piece I was working hard is not enough. Trying to go out and work hard. You have to have that hope and that faith and that belief that God knows what's best and you're going to do whatever it takes and have that hope no matter what the circumstance lies at the end of the day. We must show God that we are a hopeful people and that we still believe in him even when we, we, lose, we, we lose our dreams. We lose our, I shouldn't say we lose our dreams, but when we lose faith, when we lose something that's temporal, something that's not temporal is his plan of salvation, is his, his plan of redemption, the opportunity for us to return and live with him again. That's something that's eternal, not temporal. All the losses that we're losing now are temporal losses, not eternal losses, with the love of God and, and of all men. Another one for you to see tonight. I love this one by, by our prophet. Take a picture of that. Screen save it. Look at it often. President Russell M. Nelson says, when the Savior knows you truly want to reach up to him, when he can feel, so when the Savior can feel, that the greatest desire of your heart is to draw his power into your life, you will be led by the Holy Ghost to know exactly what you should do. Do you know how powerful that statement is? When the Savior realizes that you are devoted strictly to him, he will 
He will give you such power in your life that you'll be led by the spirit of prophecy through the Holy Ghost, which is the true formation of prayer, on exactly what you should do. Look at the prophet Joseph Smith. Look at President Nelson as they've closed down temples and begin to reopen temples. Do you think he just made that up? Our prophet did that because he was listening to the Spirit of God. And finally, one of my favorites. Take a picture of this one. God's peace is not the calm after. We're not going to wait for the pandemic to end. It's the steadfastness during the pandemic. How steadfast are we going to be during this time of crisis and challenge? I want you all to know, I hope that you know, that, uh, that I believe in God. Sorry, looking at the wrong camera. I want you to know that there's no such thing as false hope. Only false hopelessness. Because for everything that we do know, there's so much more that we don't. And tomorrow is going to be a better day. And that is my testimony to each of you tonight. In the name of Jesus the Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you so much there, Brother Hymas. I'm so sorry. I think my, I think my camera froze. <laughs> uh, did it look like my camera froze there? I'm so sorry there. Um, and so what, what I'll do here is you guys will just see this beautiful still frame picture of me while I am talking. And, uh, and then just kind of introduce here our, our next speaker. While I'm introducing our next speaker, though, first off, I mean, Chad, we're getting tons of comments regarding, you know, just the smile on, on that boy's face there. You know, I mean, yeah. so it's, I mean you, you talk about pure happiness. I mean, I love that. Uh, as well with that, I mean, we have people joining us from Santa Quin, Utah, from China. We got people uh, joining us you know, from St. George. I've guys all over. Please tell us where you guys are joining from. And as you guys are joining as well, please ask questions. Um, like I said, we'll go over those questions here later on. Um, now I'm going to get it off my frozen face here. So that way you guys aren't just looking at this creepy person talking <laughs> and then introduce our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is, I, I had him as a, a religion pre professor at BYU. He's absolutely stellar. He teaches church history and, and uh, has written many books. We're going to give and turn the time over here to Brother Anthony Sweat. Thank you so much, Mike. I was half tempted just to hold really still and be frozen, just to weird everybody else out. Well, uh, Chad, thank you for that wonderful message, and I hope that I can key in and build off on some things that uh, Chad touched on. In particular, I want to speak specifically about hope uh, with you. This is a time, as Chad mentioned, where, you know, it's an interesting time uh, during this uh, pandemic and quarantine and the virus and people are reacting differently to it. I don't know if there's a time when we need hope uh, and have the gift of hope um, um, more than ever. Uh, this is a time to have it. And what I want to speak with you about, though, is true hope. That's my message to you. Uh, what is true hope? Or maybe a better way to say it, uh, what is gospel hope? Uh, because gospel hope is different than the way we kind of use the word hope in our everyday language. So up front, I want to share with you the difference between everyday hope and eternal hope. And then I want to share with you what we can have hope in that will always help us to remain steadfast and sure. And then last, how can we obtain this kind of hope? So I would also, as Chad mentioned, uh, I would also invite you to take notes, uh, to write things down that come to your mind that I hope can help you on this uh, Sabbath evening as we're recording this. I live in Utah in a little town called Springville that I dearly love. And as I come around a corner on a main road, as I head towards my house, somebody that I just love has put up a sign and it just says, hope springs eternal. And uh, they put it up uh, be because they want us all to be hopeful. And uh, it kind of prompted me when I thought of how can we talk about eternal hope? Uh, so let me share my screen with you a little bit as I go through just some images and uh, some ideas with you. And um, let me see. Oh, whoops, hold on. That was the wrong one. Let me go back.
There we go. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, I, I got I got this title, Our Only Hope, because, uh, as you know, when Star Wars came out, I was a little boy when the first Star Wars came out, a little, little boy, but I remember watching these movies as they came out, the first three. Uh, and in the first one, you have Princess Leia who pops on there and says, help us, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Uh, you're our only hope, or you're my only hope. And uh, the title of the first Star Wars is actually, uh, well, technically it's episode four, which is extremely confusing for all of us, but we won't get into that, George Lucas. But it's called A New Hope. Um, and what's interesting is, you know, Star Wars does talk a lot about hope, and I don't want to do nerdy uh, gospel Star Wars comparisons because those have been done for decades. Uh, but what I do want to say that's interesting is uh, this idea that there's a new hope uh, or that Obi-Wan Kenobi is our only hope. When all of a sudden there's not hope when we get the new movies that come along and there's not hope because those next few movies weren't as good and we lo lose our hope not only in Obi-Wan Kenobi and Luke Skywalker, but also in the Star Wars trilogy uh, as a whole and the prequels. But then, oh, Ray comes and now we got hope again, don't we? Uh, hope comes back. But uh, what I want you to know is that hope is not in people. Hope's not in Ray or Anakin Skywalker turning good or Yoda, or maybe in Baby Yoda, if you've really been liking that off the Mandalorian. Uh, hope also, when I talk about gospel hope with you, hope is not just positive thinking either. Now, don't get me wrong. Positive thinking is important, and we all should do our best to develop that. But what I want to say maybe up front is positive thinking will be an automatic result if you gain gospel hope. Gospel hope gives us a powerful, a more than just motivational positive thinking. Gospel hope is not wishing either. Uh, as you can see, you know, there's always hope tomorrow will be taco night. Uh, sometimes in our everyday language, when we talk about hope, we use it as a synonym for a wish. Like, well, I hope that tomorrow's good. I, I hope that uh, they you know, are able to resume school dances. I, I hope that we'll be able to start playing sports again. I hope that, uh, you know, really we could replace hope in those sentences with the word wish. And so if we use it that way, we're not using it in the way that the gospel or that the scriptures or that the prophets use the gift of hope. So what is the scriptural gift, gift of hope? If I could give you this one line summary, it's this one. Hope in the gospel sense means that you and I gain a personal assurance of God's promises. So this isn't hope, um, uh, like I said, like just wishful thinking or positivity. This is saying, I know what God has promised. And then I get a personal assurance that that promise will be mine. As uh, True to the Faith says, this is what makes us, if we wanna get steadfast, if we wanna be steadfast in Christ, I put this little graphic on there of an anchor because the Apostle Paul in the New Testament and the prophet Mormon say that hope is like an anchor. It grounds us or it makes us steadfast. It makes us sure and unwavering. Why? Because we're not putting our trust or our hope in other people necessarily or in programs or in fallible mortal things. We're putting our trust in eternal things and in God and in particular through his son. And those things are steadfast, immovable, and they make us unwavering and sure. As uh, when he was in the first presidency, Dieter F. Uchtdorf said this, quote, hope is the abiding trust that the Lord will fulfill his promise to us. Now look at that again, I bolded that there, that the Lord will fulfill his promise to us. It is confidence that if we live according to God's laws and the words of his prophets now, we will receive desired blessings in the future. So one thing up front, you guys, that I really wanna emphasize
is this personal assurance. One of the differences between faith and hope is faith is trust, but hope is personal. Hope means we have an assurance of a promise. So somebody could say, I have faith that God answers prayers, like they believe in that. But hope says God will answer my prayers. Or somebody could say, I have faith that Jesus forgives sins. If you're a teenager out there with hope, you will learn and you'll be assured that God will forgive your sins, no matter what they are. Somebody could say, I have faith that God has a plan. But if you have the gift of hope, you start to say, no, I, I know that God has a plan for me. And so hope is very personal and it's centered in the promises. I hope you're grasping that personal promises of God. The apostle Paul put it this way, show the same diligence of a full assurance of hope who through faith, you and I inherit the promises. And that makes an anchor sure and steadfast. So one way I want you to kind of think of hope is one day I was watching um, I was watching Netflix and I was watching this series. I won't say what it was, but all of us have gotten too much uh, series and multi-movie time lately. But I was watching this series on Netflix and um, that one of the lead characters got shot. And I couldn't believe that they were going to kill off in this show, one of the lead characters. And I, I couldn't believe it. I, I even said to my wife, like, how, how will they ever resolve that? How, how could the plot go forward? And I was like, well, I don't know, I guess I'll never know. And then all of a sudden I realized, oh no, I have all the episodes already in front of me. So I jumped ahead a number of episodes and watched down the road and saw how things turned out. Then I went back and watched the rest of the episodes with a perfect brightness of hope, if that makes sense, because I knew how things were going to turn out. So does that make sense? Like as you and I study the Book of Mormon, I've always been fascinated that while Lehi and his family were still in the wilderness when they had left Jerusalem. They're still in the wilderness. They haven't even built a boat and crossed an ocean yet. Lehi says to his family, I have obtained a promised land. He speaks in the past tense as though it's already happened. Why? Because through a gift of the Spirit, he had already been assured that his family would obtain this promise land of God. That's the gift of hope. Spiritually, it's to look ahead and to know what God is going to do for you and I. It's a beautiful, beautiful thought. Hope is not centered in Obi-Wan Kenobi or in Ray, as much as I like those Star Wars figures. Hope is only centered, eternal hope only comes in Christ. Uh, President Boyd K. Packer of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles said, Jesus Christ is the source of our hope. Or as our Book of Mormon says, what is it that ye shall hope for? Behold, I say unto you, ye shall have hope through the atonement of Christ. Notice how, yes, we can hope that certain things change in our life or in society, and we should work towards those. I'm not minimizing that. But again, our eternal hope, our steadfast hope, our unmovable hope are, uh, is always in Christ. So if hope means that you and I have a personal assurance of God's promises through Christ, then a big question is this, what is Jesus promising us? And I wanna give you six promises of the Savior that he is promising you right now uh, whatever your life situation is, if you happen to hear this. Here's the six promises I would go over. Number one, Jesus promises that he will cleanse you. And I'll talk about these in detail uh, in a second. Number two, he promises he will heal you. He promises he will restore you. And I'll explain these again so that you see what I'm getting at. He promises he will identify with you. Jesus promises that he will strengthen you. 
and he promises that he will transform you. Now, as you look at those, cleanse, heal, restore, identify, strengthen, and transform, you might be asking yourself, why did he use those words? Why did he use the word identify instead of relate? Well, if you look closely, look at the first letter of each of those words. And this is a little acrostic that I have often used to remind myself of what Jesus the Christ promises me. Remember, Christ is a title. Christ is not his last name. Christ is a title for what our Savior will do. It means the anointed one. What is Christ anointed to do? He's anointed to cleanse, heal, restore, identify, strengthen, and transform. And some of you are already getting it. He is the Christ. So I want you to remember this acrostic, this breakdown. In your mind, when you say, how will Jesus help me? How can I have hope in him? Remember his title of Christ. And in your mind, refresh these and go C, cleanse, H, heal, I, identify. Uh, oh, sorry, R, restore, I, identify, S, strengthen, T, He'll transform. So let me touch on each of these for one minute. Remember, Christ isn't just his name. It's a power that he'll give us in life. So what is his cleansing promise or his cleansing power? His cleansing power is that he promises that he will freely, frequently, and fully forgive your sins and mine. Look at those three words. Those are important because some people think, well, he'll only forgive me after I do a all these things. No, he says, as soon as you'll repent, which means to rededicate and realign with God. Some people think, well, he might only forgive me if I did this once, but if I screw up again and again and again, he won't forgive me if I keep doing this. He's promised that he will. The book of Mosiah says, as oft as my people repent, will I forgive their sins. As often as we repent, frequently. He also promises that he will fully forgive your sins. There might be someone out there, and as particularly for you teenagers, as we enter our teenage years, we start to make mistakes because that's part of learning. We're trying to learn how to control ourselves and our minds and our mouths and our bodies and what we do. And, and we realize that we've made mistakes. And some people think, well, I was better off. I was pure before, but now I've made this mistake. And now I, I can never be pure again. No, Christ will fully forgive your sins. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. There's no asterisk. There's no dot next to your name. Once you and I repent, Jesus says, I remember it no more. Christ will fully, that's his promise. What's his healing power? Well, this is a curious one. Because often when we think of healing, we think of the things that he did in the New Testament where he walked around and cured people of their physical infirmities. But even though he did that and he can heal us physically, um, Christ's most prevalent promise is that he will heal us spiritually and emotionally. There is no way that Jesus is going to take away all the pro physical problems of mortality. Yes, we may be healed to continue our physical mission. Yes, miracles happen, and we should pray for and even um, uh, believe in, and we will see those. But they won't happen every time. And so what's, what, what I'm getting at here is sometimes what you and I want to be is cured. To be cured means we go back to the way we used to be before the problem, before the sickness, before the injury, before the debilitation. But remember, Jesus' promise is he will heal us. And healing often has to do with what's going on inside our minds and in our hearts, in our souls, and in our spirits. I think the healing that goes on internally is often more prevalent and even more miraculous than some of the healing that does happen externally or physically. What's his next promise? He promises that if you and I will turn to him, he will restore us. Now, this is a promise we don't talk often enough about. And as you can see right here, the restoring power means this. 
The central feature of Jesus' atonement is to perfectly right any mortal wrong, any of them. And there's no way around it, you guys. In this life, in this mortal life, we will all experience unfairness and injustice. Listening to Chad give his uh, his talk, um, Chad did not deserve. That's it's unfair. It's unjust. Um, the the difficulties that he's experienced because of his injury. Well, what does the restoring power say for that? Or somebody who loses a child, or somebody who has an opportunity taken away from them unfairly. The restoring power says Jesus will perfectly right every mortal wrong. Now, not in this time, but eventually he will. He promises it. He says, I am taking good notes. I note the fall of every sparrow. You and I want these things to be fixed right now. And sometimes Jesus does restore in this life even more than what we lost originally. Uh, take this this painting that, uh, that you see on this screen. I'm I'm an artist also, um, and this is a painting that I did of the Provo City Center Temple. As you remember, the bottom part there is in pioneer times, the black and white part. That was built as a tabernacle. It then caught on fire and was almost completely devastated. And then President Monson announced that they were going to restore this building as a temple. So in other words, Jesus, through his servants as a metaphor, was going to put it back into a condition even greater than it was before. And that's the promise of Christ. He says, I promise you, all injustices, just look at this line right here. Whether in this life or the next, Christ will repay, he'll reinstate, he'll renew, he'll refresh, he will return any blessing that was lost, denied, or taken in this life. He will perfectly restore, rectify, redeem, and recompense any injustice or any undue suffering that was a result of our mortal experience. He promises to do that as the Savior to conquer the effects of the fall of Adam and Eve. And that likely will not happen until the millennium, but it is a promise that he will do that. His identifying power is this. He promises that he will relate with us. One of the things that's beautiful about Jesus is Jesus came to this earth to experience mortality. And the scriptures tell us that he experienced everything that you and I do in some way. He was mortal in every sense of the word. He got sick. He got tired. He got hurt. He dealt with a mortal body. Uh, but not only that, through his atonement, he descended below them all. He felt and experienced everything that humanity does so that he can ascend above it all. I love this. This is from a Christian poet. He wrote about Jesus. The other gods were strong, but thou wast weak. They rode, but thou didst stumble to a throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has wounds, but thou alone. To some people, like the Romans in Jesus' time, the idea that a God could suffer, bleed, and die, they thought, what a weak God. But the Book of Mormon tells us that Jesus came to do that so that he will know how to help us. He says that he did that so that he can identify with us, relate with us, and therefore know how to help us. None of us can say, God, you don't understand what I'm going through. Because through his atonement, Jesus Christ perfectly understands what all of us are going through. And therefore, he promises that he can know how to help us. Last two, his strengthening power. If you read in the scriptures, Jesus says, I promise I will strengthen you in your mort mortal sufferings and in your mortal trials and in your mortal temptations. There's three ways that he promises that he'll strengthen us if we turn to him. Number one, he promises to give us strength to faithfully endure trials and challenges. Sometimes this is just mortality and the challenges and trials are not taken away, but he'll give us strength to faithfully endure them, kind of like how we just read about in the Come Follow Me curriculum with Alma's people. He didn't take away their burden, but he made it lighter. 
so that they could bear the burden. Number two, every one of us are tempted uh, to make mistakes and to commit sins. He promises that as we turn to him, he will give us power to work through those temptations and sins and to learn how to overcome them. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil or suffer us, the Joseph Smith translation, to not be led into temptation. And third, Jesus promises you and me that he'll give us strength to perform work beyond our natural capacities. Yes, you are a capable person, but I promise you that with Christ in a covenant relationship with him, he will make more out of you than you can ever become on your own. And I know that's true. Last thing, the transforming power of Christ. The first miracle that Jesus ever did in public was he turned water to wine. And when you think about that, that's kind of a trivial miracle. Like, hey, we ran out of some party wine. Um, we need more drinks. Why did he use his divine power for such maybe not, uh, you know, he wasn't relieving human suffering. This was just at a party. Well, I think he was trying to take, make a statement. And as I wrote here, Jesus used the miracle of turning water into wine to send the profound message that he had the power to change the very nature of things, to transform not just the state of liquids, but the state of lives. I testify to you that if you will come to Christ, Christ promises that he will change you. He will take a bad person and make them good. He'll take a good person and make them great. And he'll make a great person and turn them into somebody like God. That's what he, that's what he transforms us into. Little by little, line upon line, bit by bit, by his grace. Okay, three ways as I conclude, three practical things to do so that you and I can gain hope in the promises of Christ. Number one, learn of Jesus and his promises. You guys, part of the benefit of this fireside is to simply learn what he's promising. Uh, the more you and I learn of him, hope will naturally come because we'll learn what he's promised us. And then we can start to get a confirmation from the Holy Ghost that he will surely keep those promises with us. Number two, Oh, as Elder Bednar said, sorry, quote, trust and confidence in Christ and a ready reliance on his merits, mercy, and grace lead to hope through his atonement. The more you learn about his merits, his mercy, and his grace, the more you'll have hope. Number two, I want you to literally pray for the gift of hope. Um, the Book of Mormon tells us to do it with all the energy of our soul, literally I say personal prayers and I say, God, please bless me with the gift of faith. Please bless me with the gift of hope in your son. Please bless me with the gift of charity for uh, and love, for God, love of God and love of all men. I pray for, for, for those things. And little by little, God has given me some of those gifts. I continue to pray for them so I can get more of them. Specifically ask for the gift of hope through his son. Number th um, third, the way you and I inherit promises is we make covenants. Covenants cause us to get promises. That's why we enter covenants. Um, I made a covenant with my wife and she promised things with me and I promised things with her. And therefore we became one with each other and received each other's promises. Spiritually, you make a covenant promise with Jesus and you become one with him, and you inherit his promises as one of the people who have taken his name upon you by covenant. Elder D. Todd Christofferson said, quote, our access to God's power is through our covenants with him. In these divine agreements, God binds himself to sustain, sanctify, and exalt us in return for our commitment to serve him. I hope that that, uh, see, I just used the word there in the, in the regular sense. I hope that that uh, uh, teachings on true hope can help lead you to our one true hope, and that's in Jesus. I uh, testify to you that uh, Jesus is the Christ. I testify, as the Book of Mormon says, his promises are, sh are sure. And I testify that if you will come unto him, you can gain the gift of hope 
through him. I love him. I adore him with my whole soul. And I hope that I can be one of his disciples. And I hope you can be as well. And that this will help you to be steadfast in him. And I leave that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much there, Brother Sweat. That was absolutely stellar. Um, we do have a few questions that have come up uh, as far as they're just with Tony and, uh, or bro sorry, Brother Sweat there and with Brother Hymas. <laughs> I'll be sure to get to those here in just a second. Um, as you guys, I'm just going to tell a quick story here and then we'll have our closing prayer. And then after the closing prayer, we'll get to those uh, mess or sorry, those questions. As I tell my story, I just want to give you guys time to come in and ask a few different questions here. Um, honestly, I mean, as I'm looking here, guys, I mean, we, I'm just following along on Facebook and, and the, where we're reaching, I mean, from Nebraska, you know, to Washington, you know, Bluffdale, Mesa, Arizona, Michigan, I mean, wherever you're at, that's the beautiful thing about the gospel. I mean, it truly is incredible that wherever you're at in the world, I mean, it is all the same. Um, just a quick message of hope really quick as, as a, uh, Brother Hymas and Brother Sweat were talking today. It reminded me of a story right before I went on my mission. I was 18 years old and um, I was doing a canyon down in southern Utah. And in southern Utah, you get these really deep slot canyons. And uh, me and it was, I was with a scout group at the time. We started off on this slot canyon and we parked our car up top and then we had to walk down. It's about 1,500 feet down towards this slot canyon. Well, what we thought was going to take us 30 minutes to get to the slot canyon actually took us like an hour and a half. And then the canyon took significantly longer for us to go through. As we were going through the canyon, I started to kind of freak out because the sun had set and it was dark. And we had finally, when we came out of the canyon, I thought there is no way we are going to find the car. Like there is no way on this green earth. And um, luckily, my scout leaders were much smarter than me because one of the leaders, unbeknownst to me, <laughs> had stayed up at the car. And when we came out of the canyon, it was just a starry night. And then I looked up and on the cliff, I could see a bright light. That was it. it I mean, I could tell it was a, a flashlight of some kind, some LED, but it was just a bright light. And immediately that almost like hopeless sense of being like, we are not going to find our cars just came back. And it's because perspective was instilled in my soul. I mean, if I can just give advice to anyone there, I've seen some questions of people asking about how we can have hope again. Perspective is what does that. Eventually, you know, our little scout group, we started walking back up towards the car and we'd run into cliffs. We'd run into areas where we couldn't make it up. But because that light was always there, we had perspective on how or we had perspective on the general path that we needed to take. And uh, it's the same thing with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the same thing with hope. As we keep perspective in the Savior, I promise you that hope comes and that perspective brings hope and, and gives us endurance through our trials. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Um. I am now, I, I believe just right after this, Brother Sweat, we have one of your sons. Is that right? He's going to be giving us the closing prayer. Okay, this is my uh, my beloved son, Eli. <laughs> Go ahead, Eli. Okay. Our dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this day that we had today. We thank you for the lessons that we were able to hear. And we're thankful for all that we have. Who's just that the coronavirus pandemic can be slow down and that we can return to normal soon and we're thankful for everything and we say these things in the name of jesus christ amen amen, amen. <laughs> thanks so much eli all right so we got a, a couple of questions here first off brother sweat we've had a ton of questions about your artwork uh, <laughs> a bunch of people asking first off if where was all the artwork you used in your presentations was that all yours it was um my bachelor's degree is in painting and drawing uh, from the University of Utah. My original plans were to be a full-time studio artist. And uh, God uh, saved me from a life of poverty and uh, instead led me into the big money of religious education is what I joke about. Uh, but I, I still paint. As a matter of fact, um, my next book that I'm publishing is going to be 25 important paintings of the restoration that have never been painted before. Uh, so I use it to, I still use it in my teaching and learning and I still paint often. 
They're honestly incredible paintings. Where can they find your artwork? We've had a few questions asking that. Uh, if you if you go to uh, anthonysweat.com. Perfect. Perfect. They're, they're great. They're great pieces of art. I, I love following Brother Sweat on Instagram. And if you look up, you know, I'm assuming she's probably under Anthony Sweat or Brother Sweat on there on Instagram. He, he just yeah, great. Brother, brother Anthony Sweat, if you want to follow me on Instagram. Yeah. Perfect. I love it. I love it. Um, okay. Let's ask a few other questions here. Um, so here, here's a great question that I, I, I really think is a big one here. Um, it's how do you draw on the healing power of Christ? And, uh, you know, brother Hymas or brother sweat, either one of you can answer that, but how do you draw upon the healing power of Christ? Well, the first thought that came to my mind was the authority of the priesthood. Um, but not all of us have that luxury. I mean, the healing power of Christ really comes through the priesthood, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, uh, there are many people that uh, find healing through just uh, as, as we talked about earlier in both of our presentations or both of our comments, remarks is to first ask. I mean, there was no ironic priesthood uh, on the earth when, when Joseph Smith needed, needed a healing of sorts and to find out what direction he should go. And so I, I think that as we have uh, talked about a little bit tonight, uh, being willing to demonstrate by our behavior and show that we are submissive, humble enough, and and have a great desire in our heart and a passion to find truth and to find light and to perhaps be healed. Um, I'll just say one more thing about that. Um, many people would say that I have not been healed uh, because as you see me, I'm sitting here still and, and, and I'm still 95% numb, but that hasn't changed. But we could argue, we could argue, that I am still a farmer, which was my true passion to beginning. Still a, st still a hunting guide or a guide. And my wheelchair tires have taken me to more ground than I could have ever gone with both of my feet. These tires have touched more ground. So I'm just using that as a metaphor and what I believe the true healing power of God is. It, it's not what I thought it would be. It's not what I wanted, but it's better. And I've also been asked one thing too. I'll, I'll just end with this. If I can go back and change it the way that I was healed, or change what happened to me, would I do so? And my answer is this, uh, and some of you might think it's crazy, but that's all right. My answer is no, because if I would have to go back and change what happened to me through that pandemic, that crisis, then I wouldn't be on the camera here with you guys tonight. And I wouldn't uh, probably be in this room and we probably wouldn't have the elk that we do and do the things that we do today. So I'm not changing any of that stuff. Um, it's exactly what uh, Brother Sweat was talking about through all that, the greatest opportunities have come my way. And the same thing will happen with this pandemic. Brother Sweat. I say amen to that, Brother Hymas. Um, the only thing I would add is um, that you, you and I can't be healed by trying harder. Often we're healed by being softer. I'll say that again. We, we usually can't be healed by trying harder. It's usually by being softer. What I mean by that is in the scriptures, the Lord will often say, if, if you have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, then I will heal you. He'll use that phrase, uh, whether that healing is physically or whether that healing is internally, emotionally, to help you and I reweave our life story with our current reality. So to me, it's all about softness on the inside as a practical way, softening my heart humbling myself, submitting to God, letting him work his miracles on the inside to the outside. Love that. Amen. Amen. I have nothing to add to that. Uh, going off on that, there was another question that was asked, and, and this is a stellar one that I'm, I'm excited to hear you guys' answers on, is how can we use the atonement to forgive ourselves? Go ahead, Brother Clark. Oh, you know... That's a really tough question. Um, I'm, to be totally transparent, I, I'm still hard on myself for things, mistakes that I've made in my life. And, um, you know, I, I think number one is, is remember that um, one of the reasons why we remember the sting of sin is so that you and I, it helps us to not make the same mistake, I believe anyway. But I think there's a difference between um, uh, I don't know, like there's, there's a difference between saying, yeah, I, I regret that. And I still feel guilty for that. 
uh, we, we should let guilt go through the Savior, um, even if we still can hold on to some regrets in life and say, yeah, I, I probably shouldn't have done that. But Christ can lift the guilt uh, as we really start to understand him and his ability to heal and, and truly cleanse and let, let those sins go off, off of us. Brother Hymas, what would you say? That You could probably give a better answer I, than the I, one. I gave it to you first because I'm like you. I don't understand the atonement very well. Uh, <laughs> I think I, I don't. I don't understand the atonement very well, but I will say this. Pain is a marvelous teacher. Uh, the pain that I've gone through, the emotional pain, the physical pain, the uh, mental pain, the struggles that I've gone with as I've tried to court with my spouse or play catch with my kid with, with numb hands and a body, the, the pain is enormous. So either I can adapt and try and do something with the pain about, about the son and not taking him out, you know, to see God's nature and this kind of, that, that kind of a pain. What, what's ironic is you and I go through this pain in our life, emotional, financial pain, and we wonder why it never goes away. And it's because we don't hear the message and we don't adapt or transform ourselves. Where would I not be tonight if I didn't hear the, the, hear the message of the pain? I mean, or if I wasn't willing to, to walk differently, um, you know, change with changing circumstances. I wouldn't be in this chair here with you if I wasn't wear, willing to wear different clothes. And by the way, if you think I like these clothes, you're wrong. I mean, Brother Sweat, I'm just going to put them on the platform right now. Brother Sweat and Mike White, um, they don't have the luxury. Let me. They have luxury. I don't. I'm just going to make them both stand up right now. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about. I told you I don't like these clothes. They can actually live it. Just stand up. Mike, stand up. All right. I'm going to embarrass me. Everybody stand up right now. Stand up. No tuck in shirt. Look at that. Shorts and sweats the same way. He's got on. He just won't show you. Brother Sweat is the exact same way. I'm not saying that to put him down. I'm just saying I'm like them. I don't like these clothes. If they liked them, they would have put them on. I'm the same way. The message is not picking on them. I just when I when I'm willing to wear clothes that I can put on and that can protect my skin. Because the truth is, I need more protection with my legs than perhaps they do. I can't feel my legs. So not only do I have on one pair of pants, I have on three. I have on two long johns and I have on a pair of slacks. Not because I like it. I don't want to have a pressure sore. So here the message of the pain. I uh, just use Mike and Anthony as kind of a little joke there and, and hope you all take it the right way and i'm sure that they didn't so i'll probably get my house toilet papered but there's none for sale right now so that won't happen so i'm good you better believe man i'm going to costco right after this and buying those hundred hundred rolls look, look <laughs> anthony's off screen so he went to put pants on look, look at that he's off screen right now i just i love that <laughs> well, i think he just he just messaged in saying that his connection went a little funny there yeah, you can make it up. Cool, He's making that excuse. Yeah, yeah. We'll just pretend. Make it up. Make it up. <laughs> uh, well, um, as, as far as with that, I mean, just if I can chime in just a bit of the answer to that question, sure. and then we'll kind of wrap you up just a bit here. Um, that's something for me. I feel like I, I know I've struggled with forgiving myself, even for things that aren't even that I need to forgive myself for. I think I, I beat myself up over things where it's like, why am I beating myself up over for that? And um, I don't think I'm abnormal. I think a lot of people do that. One of the best things that has helped me, welcome back, by the way, Brother Sweat. Oh, <laughs> um, one, of, one of the best things that has helped me through that is understanding the, the grace of Jesus Christ and understanding that the whole purpose of this life is for progression. And the only way you can progress is by making mistakes and then correcting those mistakes. Uh, and and really just going from there. So that's that's the only thing I'll add on with that. Anyway, I'm uh, I, I think we're probably just a bit out of or about out of time here. And so uh, I'm I'm gonna wrap it up here. I want to give just a special thanks to Onward Productions uh, and Onward Events. That's Shane and Mandy Johnson. They do a wonderful job. They do events all over. Uh, literally, you can have Chad or, or brother or sorry, brother Hymas, brother Chad Hymas, or brother Anthony Sweat. Uh, as they come and speak and, and they do events, honestly, incredible messages. And so Brother Hymas and Brother Sweat, thank you guys so much. Everyone, thank you for joining us. This message will be after or will be uh, available after this is over. So thank you everyone for joining us. And I hope you have an incredible Sabbath. Bye, guys.